I don't think now is the time to retrench and hide. I think now is the time to forcefully make the case for why language education is important for our students today, is important for our citizens tomorrow. And we need to do this. If we as language educators are not able to make the case for language education, how can we expect people who are not part of what we do to make the case for us? You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. I'm Dan Gable, Technology Manager for the LRC. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Stefan Haritos, Language Resource Center Director at Columbia University, discusses current national trends in language study and suggests four practical recommendations that can help uphold visibility and the importance of world language education in the U.S. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. It is my pleasure to welcome my colleague Stefan Haritos. He is my counterpart at Columbia University, where he directs the Language Resource Center, among many, many, many other things. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Stefan. Thanks, Angelica. I'm pleasure to be here with you. It's such a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Uh, it's the kind of program and the kind of informational uh, activity that we need to be doing more of, in my opinion. Absolutely. But I think we'll, we'll talk about that a little more, I think, later. Yes, we certainly will. Um, so a few weeks ago, you gave a wonderful talk at the Shared Lichtel Symposium in Chicago about the future of language study in the U.S., and it had the intriguing subtitle, Short-Term Crisis or Permanent Plight. Can you please share with our listeners some of the recent national trends in language study? What have we seen and where do we think this is all headed? Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, let me first uh, just uh, say... Uh, that I was asked to talk about the Lictals and the so-called crisis in the Lictal, but I took the opportunity of speaking not about the crisis of the Lictal, but about crisis in language education in general. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the statistics, you'll see that the Lictals, and I'm using the broad definition used by the MLA, so any language outside of the 15 most commonly taught languages in the U.S., um, are really the tip of the iceberg. Hmm. Uh, the enrollments in Lictals is, is very, very small. Uh, the majority of language taught in this country are in the top 15 languages that are reported by the MLA. So it seemed to me that talking about the Lictal was missing the invisible part of the iceberg. Uh, and we needed to broaden the discussion to talk about language enrollment, and language education in general. Uh, a second reason for why I decided to talk about languages in general and not about lictals is that you can consider lictals as a canary in, in a coal mine. Hmm. What is happening uh, to the lictals today, in my opinion, and I'll share statistics and discuss this with you, will soon be uh, facing most language programs in this country, including the most uh, commonly taught languages. Hmm. So I, I broaden the discussion uh, to talk about language education. My contention is that um, language education in this country is in a crisis, but I use the crisis not to refer to something that is temporary, acute, and will pass, but rather to refer to the fact that we need to act on a situation that has been uh, festering uh, for a number of years. And the, the term crisis itself, you know, hides the fact that what we're dealing with are structural problems mm. with the way language education is, 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 uh, uh, plays out in this country. So the way I approached this was by looking at data from three reports, and yeah. we can talk about all three of them, even though the third one is about uh, uh, the situation in K-12, through and we may perhaps not be that interested in it. Well, but um, that's, that's the feeder into into our absolutely. programs, right? So, I mean, that's also well, the canary that we see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we can come back to it and we can take them in any order you want. So perhaps I'll start with the, uh, the report that was published by the American Academy uh, of Arts and uh, Sciences. Arts and, of Arts and Sciences. 
uh, they were tasked with trying to understand what the state of language in the United States were at, at currently. Mm -hmm. um, there's two statistics that they produced that seem to me to be relevant. Uh, we are in an immigrant nation. Uh, historically, we historically even in, in, even currently, the U.S. is characterized as an immigrant nation, and the percentage of people who speak another language at home is actually rising, even though that percentage remains fairly low, about 20% of all uh, households in America. But that percentage is rising. However, uh, the number of people who say they actually speak that second language well is about half of that. So about 10% of the population in the U.S. say that they speak another language uh, other uh, than English uh, at home. Yeah. That is very low. That's an incredibly low number for an immigrant nation. Yeah. So in a sense, uh, we're not doing a good job, whether at the K through 12 or at the post-secondary uh, level, uh, in teaching uh, our fellow Americans uh, another language, either from the beginning uh, or helping them reinforce a language that they're learning at home. There, there are not enough language teacher at the K through 12 level to meet the needs of even, even, even the basic needs uh, of that percentage of the population. And to, to pivot now to the second report, which is a report on the state of the K through 12 educational landscape in, in the US, only about 20% of, 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 of students enrolled in the K through 12 are taking a, a language course. Mm -hmm. That's compared to, you know, 92% mm -hmm. in Europe. Yep. Um, so Americans are simply, or American children are simply not being exposed to a foreign language, either because they're not interested or because somebody has decided that this is not valuable and we shouldn't be wasting time and money on this. And it's basically... Um, Putting America at a disadvantage uh, with the rest of the world, in yeah. my opinion. But the one statistics that kind of capture where we're at with uh, language education at the K through 12 level, uh, we know that the federal government has defined a group of language called critical languages, um, and has targeted these languages as being languages that are critical for security and for the welfare of this country. Yeah, and yet. Eight times more students take Latin than Arabic at the K through 12 level. So <laughs> we're not really getting any traction uh, at the K 12 level. And as we were talking earlier before we started with the program, the problem with this is that the K through 12 is the feeder that feeds students in, in, into the post secondary uh, sure. education levels. So we're feeding less students than before. And most of the students who are coming are coming if they come with a foreign language, with Spanish, possibly French. So this is reflected actually in the third statistics that I shared at the, the conference, which is the, the MLA enrollment uh, data yeah. uh, that's been released uh, last year. Um, nationwide, 62% of all enrollments are in French and Spanish. Hmm. Uh, so again, you see the role of the feeder of the, the secondary school feeder into post-secondary enrollments. But I, I think, you know, that's just an epiphenomena. Uh, and there are more troubling uh, statistics with the MLA uh, report. Um, there had been a surge of optimism uh, from 2006, 2009, when enrollments in foreign language had been up by 6%. Yeah. Uh, but in 2009 and from 2009 and 13, so the previous report had uh, indicated that these numbers had dropped again by about 7%, a little less than 7%. The hope had been that this would have been a temporary blight and that that blip on the radar would have been gone. And again, you know, you can hear here the, the rhetoric of crisis. Mm -hmm. We had hoped that this kind of acute crisis would have passed and we would have gone back to business as usual. However, the statistics that were released last year and that look at enrollments from 2013 to 2016 show that this is indeed not the case and that the trend downwards has accelerated since we now are recording a, an additional drop of about 9%. Hmm. So in about nine years, eight to nine years, enrollments have dropped close to 17% uh, across the U.S., 
across all post-secondary institutions where languages are taught. Um, that's frightening to a certain degree, especially if this is a trend that is not you know, a temporary kind of uh, blip on the radar. And I've done some, uh, some trend analysis looking at the similar numbers since uh, uh, the beginning and this, the MLA started collecting numbers in, in, in the early 60s. And if you do a trend analysis, you will see that the trend has been downwards uh, from the beginning, hmm. despite, you know, uh, occasional ups. Uh, but the trend has been downwards, and I'm afraid will continue to be downwards, and is now affecting not just the less commonly taught languages, but all languages, yeah. including Spanish, French, and the other most commonly taught languages. The other statistics one can see from the MLA, which are also troubling, um, is the fact that enrollments in upper level uh, language courses have dropped across the board. Yeah. That yeah. simply means that we are enrolling what what whatever students we are enrolling in the lower levels, but these students are not continuing past the intermediate level. So not only are they not achieving, you know, any kind of proficiency that functional proficiency that would allow them to to use their language uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, but I think eventually, and we probably are looking at this already, we will then see the impact on this on majors, minors, and concentrators. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have language requirements being attacked and being reduced. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the future for language at the upper level does not look good. Uh, the other statistics that to me uh, was uh, a little bit... Uh, frightening was the fact that the number of schools where no language at all is being taught is steadily inching upwards hmm. from 176 in 2009 to over 200, uh, 220 now uh, in, in 2017, 2016. And are these K-12 schools or? No, these are high, these are post-secondary education oh, wow. that I've okay. done away with language uh, <laughs> education uh, entirely. Um, perhaps the last statistics that I will share, and this is not, it is in the MLA report, but you have to do your own number crunching, is that 70% of schools offer six languages or less. Hmm. So, you know, when we talk about less commonly taught languages and the plight of less commonly taught languages, we're really talking about how this is affecting uh, a very small number of schools. Actually, 3% of schools or 70, about 70 institutions in the country offer more than 15 languages, Cornell and Columbia being mm. two of them. Uh, but most of the, 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 the institution in this country offer less than six languages and 72% of them offer uh, basically three languages or less. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation that we're dealing with. And unfortunately, I don't think it's going to get better by itself. Sure. So do you do you think that, um, I mean, we always read that uh, funding concerns are an issue, that we're spending too much time, too much money on languages, um, and that we're putting our students at a disadvantage because they can't focus on their major. Um, do you think that there are also methodological concerns with the approach of how languages are taught? I mean, what's the cause of this? So, you know, the second part of my talk was trying to understand a little bit of, you know, where is this coming from? And I, I really don't want to, you know, dwell in all eight of the categories that sure. I outlined. But I will say, you know, I'll, I'll talk about three of them very briefly. Um, there is, unfortunately, in this country, a rise uh, of nativism and nationalist uh, rhetoric that basically basically implies that it's an either or uh, mm -hmm situation with regards to English and, and a foreign language. You either speak English and you are an American, or you don't and you're not. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of feeding kind of a rhetoric uh, that is uh, poisoning the well of, of language education, in a sense. Uh, the second reason, and it's linked to this, uh, is the global rise or the rise of global English. So for many people in this country, 
the fact that other people are studying English kind of like uh, protects us from the need to learn their language since they're learning our language. And a lot of people have uh, assimilated this kind of rhetoric, this idea that because English is becoming the global language, we as a nation and as a people uh, no longer have to worry about studying their language. And I think that's a very uh, short-sighted view. Um, the third one, uh, that I, the third reason I'd like to talk is that, you know, languages being part of the humanities are caught up in the larger crisis that's affecting the humanities mm. at post-secondary uh, level. Um, and this is caught up in a discussion of, you know, what is the role of a university in today's society? What is the function that a university is called to play? Is it a place where we are trying to uh, form, uh, nurture, and educate a citizenry that is well-versed uh, in, in, in well-rounded uh, arts? Or is it basically a training program for tomorrow's uh, job uh, workforce? Yeah. Uh, and I think these two views of what the role of education is in society are, are, are uh, fighting it out. And for many people, perhaps less so in the institutions where you and I have the luck to work, but certainly in public funded institutions, um, a lot of people see that uh, or believe that the role of a university is to prepare our students to be workers in tomorrow's society. Mm -hmm. uh, and since they don't see any value in a foreign language, considering that the fact that the rest of the world is learning English, they feel that spending money on foreign language is a waste of time. So this is what we're dealing with. Uh, I don't think it's a question of methodology. I think it's a question of, you know, people want quote unquote value for money and they feel that, you know, their money, the money they spent to send their kids uh, to college. And I will parenthetically say here, uh, look at the rise in, in student debt. This is something that mm -hmm. will burden them after they leave the university. They want to make sure that their students, uh, that their kids uh, get an education that will allow them to come out of the university and, and quickly make money to pay off that debt. And they don't see, they simply do not see how language education plays a, a role in this, in, in this scenario. Well, that's um, <laughs> not, not so happy outlook. <laughs> Well, so the, the question then is, what can we as language educators do to be invigorated, to not let ourselves be dragged down by these negative numbers, by, by this um, frightful outlook? What are some of the things that we can actively do to increase enrollments, to, you know, raise advocacy, to work with the upper administration? Do you have the magic bullet? Sure. I don't have a magic bullet, but, you know, I still think there are a number of things we, we can do. This was the last part of my talk where I suggested, you know, four axes of actions, coordinated axes of actions that we should take in order to address the situation. I don't think uh, now is the time to retrench and hide. I think now is the time to forcefully uh, make the case for why language education is important is important for our students today, is important for our citizens tomorrow. Um, and we need to do this. We need to do this. We should not expect other people to do it for us. Uh, if we are not able to make the case, if we as language educators are not able to make the case for language education, how can we expect people who are not part of what we do to make the case for us? Um, so, as I said, you know, I think we need to articulate our response around four axes, and I'll talk about all four of them briefly. Uh, I think we need to do a better job uh, with information. Mm -hmm. uh, and by information, I think I mean two things. We need to better inform ourselves of what our students want out of a language education, what their parents want from a language education, what society expects from a language education. Uh, one of the things we don't do very well at the university level 
is ask our students what it is that they want uh, out of the education they're receiving. We tend to think that we know what they want and we will give them what we think they want. So I think we need to do a better job of informing ourselves as to why students are taking uh, foreign language classes, why they've decided not to take foreign language classes, what they hope to accomplish for foreign language, what alumni have or have not done with their foreign language. So we need to inf better inform ourselves. We also need to do a better job of informing students both about the value of a foreign language education. What does uh, the research tell us uh, about the value of learning another language? So information, I think, is the first axis. The second axis that I, that I talked about was advocacy. It's not enough to collect information. You need to do something with that information. Sure. And that information needs to be put in front of decision makers. We need to put you know, these stories, these success stories, these narratives of transformation uh, in front of them. My experience has always been that it's, it's, it's fairly easy for an administrator to say yay or nay, and usually nay, when he's faced... <laughs> or when they're faced with numbers. Numbers uh, are uh, impersonal. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to say no when that number has a face, has a story, uh, has something tied to it that shows the value of what that number has done to this person. So, you know, it's very easy to cut a Swahili program. It's a lot harder to cut a Swahili program where a number of alumni, a number of students have talked how they've used their language skill to transform themselves and transform a, 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 a society in Eastern Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to put these stories in front of the people who are making a decision. So information or inform and advocate, I think, are two of the, the, the four legs of the stools. The other two, and I'll talk about the third one, is innovate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we want to be meaningful and if we want to have a meaningful uh, impact on our students' uh, lives, we need to offer them courses that are meaningful to them. And that means that we have to innovate what we offer, both from the point of view of what we do in the program itself, in the classroom itself. Uh, we need to make our language classrooms more meaningful to students. We need to uh, show them how language is uh, something, a skill, uh, a mindset that is useful to them today. But we also need to better connect the classroom to other disciplinary, the language classroom to other disciplinary areas so that we can show students how what they're doing in the language classroom articulates with other classrooms and other programs at the university. But we also need perhaps to better articulate how the language classroom uh, plays out with uh, society at large outside the classroom. Hmm, yeah. uh, so I think we need to innovate uh, so that we remain current and we remain relevant uh, to students. Uh, remember that a lot of our students, and I'm not just talking about students at Cornell, Columbia, the other Ivies, I'm talking about students in general, have a desire to make a meaningful impact on the world around them. Mm. Um, so we should be thinking about things like service-based learning, project-based learning, community-based learning. Uh, we need to be enabling our students to go out there and use their skills, the full range of their skills, not only their language skills, to make the difference a lot of them want to make in the world out there. Yep. And then the last axis uh, would be collaboration. Um, unfortunately, in today's climate, it's very, very hard for the sum total of, of knowledge uh, to be available locally on every campus. We have to make choices. So in order to minimize the damage that these choices uh, make, I think we need to collaborate with partners so that we can share uh, experience, resources, knowledge, and uh, create more meaningful opportunities uh, for students uh, that are not available locally, but are available through technology, through shared uh, opportunities. 
collaborate between uh, the social sciences and the hard sciences and the language programs, collaborate within the classroom, um, you know, teach our students to work not as individual, but as part of teams uh, that extend both within the classroom and outside the classroom to other sections, other language, or, you know, perhaps even to the community uh, outside uh, the university. I think we all need to do this and we need to do it in a coordinated way. Let me re reiterate, I don't think this is the time to, you know, turn back to the ostrich uh, strategy mm -hmm. and try to hide our head in the sand, hoping that, you know, this crisis will bypass us. And here, you know, perhaps because I'm Greek, I'll turn to the second meaning of the word crisis, which is the one I think we should dwell upon. So not this kind of acute, uh, temporary uh, uh, problem that will pass away, but crisis in the original meaning of the word in Greek, which means a moment where a decision has to be made. Mm. I think we need to make the decision now as language professional that we need to defend and we need to promote language education. Fantastic. Well, I mean that that on that note, I actually think we need to let this stand. I mean, this is this is exactly what um, some of our other colleagues have said too. We shouldn't be threatened, right? We should feel invigorated by this. Um, I think you just very neatly cut out the path forward in exactly what we need to do to inform, advocate, innovate, and collaborate. So there, listeners, you have it. Um, Stefan, thank you so much for this very insightful synopsis of where we are with the languages and where we need to go. It's my pleasure, Angelica. And let me once again say, you know, what we need perhaps is more programs like this. You know, we need to be able to get the word out locally, but also beyond the local boundaries of our institutions about what we're doing, why what we're doing matters, and what we're hoping to do new and innovative uh, moving forward. Uh, otherwise, we're going to let other people define us, and I don't think we should. Yep, agreed. Absolutely. Well, and to actually pick up on the need to be new and innovative, next week I will speak with members of the student organization Language Expansion Program here at Cornell. LEP is a student-led program that fosters language learning in a comfortable, encouraging environment. They do exactly what Stefan suggested. They inform, advocate, innovate, and collaborate. Find out more about their programming and events next week. Until then, auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Sam Lupwitz and Dan Gable. Recorded by Sam Lupwitz. Original music by Sam Lupwitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners and do stay tuned for our next episode.